the Sahara, as vast as the United States. For centuries, only camel trains attempted to cross this hostile barrier between the Mediterranean and West Africa, lured on by the riches to be found at Timbuktu. Yet every autumn, millions of birds from all over Europe and Asia make this hazardous crossing. For many, the first sign that they have reached their winter home is the River Niger flowing through the sands near Timbuktu. As an artist, I've spent many summers in Europe watching and painting long-distance travellers like these Gargany. But their life in Europe fills only a tiny part of the picture. To complete the canvas, I've put my studio on my back and followed these birds to West Africa. Although I've come to paint migrants, I can't ignore resident birds like this magnificent fish eagle. A bird which dominates every waterway in Africa. The fish eagle is a vital part of the habitat which the migrants have come so far to exploit. There's an incredible contrast between this landscape and the one they've left behind. The light's more intense, it's far hotter, and from the moment I arrived, I became conscious that I couldn't isolate the birds from the people. I've never been to a place where the lives of both are so closely linked. It seems incredible that the birds should make that long journey across the Sahara to Mali. But Timbuktu is only a stopover point. The place the birds and I really seek lies south of here, a watery paradise beyond Timbuktu. Rain falls in the West African highlands in summer. The water is carried down the Niger and by August reaches the plains of Mali. It floods an area almost the size of Belgium, transforming it into a fantastically rich wetland. When the flood peaks in October, two million waterfowl descend on this inland delta and the lake at its heart hosts the largest concentration of water birds in West Africa. I soon discovered that the delta is also a seasonal home for half a million people and that it must provide a livelihood to see them through the whole year. Fishermen, millet and rice farmers all depend on the flood. The grazing feeds over one and a half million sheep and goats and a million head of cattle. It was this river market that first brought home to me how rich the delta can be during the flood season. There aren't many luxuries here, but I can find everything I need. Wood for a fire, pots for cooking, and a mat to sleep on. And if I needed it, I could buy salt, still carried as great slabs as it has been for centuries by camel from the desert.
Rising from the bustle is a wonderful smell, as old as time. It's great to be here. The well-being of these people depends on the size of the flood. But since the early 70s, the rains have been poor and the extent of the flood has gradually dropped. In 1984, only a fifth of the delta flooded and I'm told that this year it's almost as bad. Each year, soon after the flood peaks, the water begins to fall back. People, cattle and birds all follow the water as it drains to the lake at the heart of the delta. I want to paint an accurate picture of life here, so I too must make that same journey, beginning at the edge of the floodplain, out in the arid Sahel. The Sahel is a fringe of land which separates the Sahara from the savannas and woodlands further south. Rainfall has always been sparse and unpredictable here, but before the drought the nomadic people were well able to cope, moving their herds quickly towards any new growth that appeared. These people have come through the severe drought of 1984 but their land remains overgrazed and exhausted. Another bad year is the last thing they need. This well is over 150 foot deep, but already, only a few months after the summer rains, the water table is so low that the herdsmen must wait an age for each bucket to fill. Right now, while the delta is underwater, the cattle have been forced out to find grazing in the Sahel. Survival here is on a knife edge, and I feel a little uneasy about sitting here painting. But I am trying to understand the whole picture, and I've got to start somewhere. For me, the most distinctive shape in the Sahel is the baobab, the upside down tree, because it appears to hold its roots in the air. I always start by putting down an impression of the landscape. To really understand birds, they must be seen in their own surroundings. I can lose myself for hours in a painting, but I'll always welcome a diversion. In this case, a woodchat shrike. This is the first time I've watched one impale its prey on a thorn. No wonder they're called butcher birds. One of the best things about painting here is the hot, dry wind. It dries the paint rapidly, so I can work fast and don't have to wait between laying down washes of colour. Flowering acacias, alive with the hum of insects. There's rich pickings here for migrant warblers. I'm amazed that the flowers come months after the rains, but it's great timing for visitors like the hoopoe. But the family of birds I must sketch are the real long distance travelers, the wheatiers. Last time I painted wheatiers, they were surrounded by melting snow in Scandinavia. But this fellow, the black-eared wheatier, hasn't travelled that far. He's only come from Spain. 
It's time to grab some sketches. The larger Isabelline wheatear comes from the steppes of Central Asia, while the northern wheatear makes one of the longest journeys of any land bird, some from as far away as Alaska. One species from the far north, one from Asia and one from the Mediterranean, and yet I can sketch all three here in the Sahel. By December, the nomadic families and their herds must move on again. The grazing in the Sahel is finished, but these cattle have a second chance, the floodplain. Out there, the water has begun to recede, and they're making their way to the fresh grazing that's now exposed. Each year, the herds must travel further and further to find the flood. Following them, I pass crops which have failed through lack of rain, and forests dead because the flood no longer reaches them. It's not surprising that when the people do find food, they grab it. A nomadic shepherd feels little responsibility for the people coming behind him. How can he be expected to worry about next year when his goats are hungry today? But the tragedy is that these trees will now die too, hacked down before they have a chance to set seed. It's easy to find places where the end result is only too clear. At last, I can see the flood. In some areas, the transition is sudden, in others, gradual, the mix of vegetation suggesting the flood doesn't always come. This fig tree is a telltale sign that a village once stood here. In its shade, the village elders would have gathered to sit in council and gossip. I can imagine them looking out over a much greener landscape. Abandoned by the flood, the people have moved on, and now this fig tree is home to birds which prefer a drier habitat, like little green bee eaters. watching them whacking their prey senseless before they eat it. It's almost too quick to draw. An easier subject is a chanting goshawk. The black-headed plover, always noisy, is as good a sign as any that water can't be far away. As the pools left by the flood dry out, the ooze is packed solid with food for the waders. The pickings are only temporary, for in a few days the birds, like the cattle, must move on, following the edge of the flood.
This herd has reached a tributary of the Niger. Traditionally, it was the local Fulani chief who decided when each herd could cross to fresh grazing. The chief controlled the grazing and based his decision on the amount of grass available and his relationship with the herdsmen built up over years of making the same journey. But today, all land in Mali officially belongs to the government, so the Fulani no longer have absolute control over their grazing lands. Huge areas of grassland, about one-sixth of the delta in all, have already been converted into irrigated rice fields. As the size of the natural flood gets smaller, competition for the use of this flooded land is increasing. The creation of these new habitats actually helps some species of birds. The network of dikes and channels holds water long after the flood has passed. And in a similar way, the rice, harvested in December and January, releases insects for the yellow wagtails. Last summer, I sketched yellow wagtails in Sweden in surroundings almost identical to these. There, they were feeding with shiny black crows, but here they're with an exotic bird, the brilliant carmine bee-eater. And nearby, yet another migrant I saw in Sweden, a blue throat. Many of these workers are migrants too. They've come from areas where the crop has failed and will be paid for their efforts in sacks of rice. The grain harvest triggers an explosion of mice, a fantastic place for raptor watching. Flight like a moth. Beautiful. This marsh owl reminds me of a short-eared owl I sketched hunting across that same Swedish wetland. Two similar species in a similar habitat, yet 3,000 miles and a continent apart. After the harvest, the cattle come in to graze the rice straw and the dung they leave behind will fertilize the fields. But the farmers are anxious to plow before the ground is baked too hard, so the herds must move on. The birds move on too. Some, like kites and vultures, follow the cattle, always ready to scavenge on the inevitable casualties. Everything is travelling deeper into the heartland of the delta. Here, on the open floodplain, the cattle graze wild grasses, while out on the marshes and water lily lagoons, 
the harriers constantly harass the duck. Around a million gargany. And that means right now over a quarter of the world population is here. The importance of this delta for the survival of millions of birds is without doubt. But this is neither a national park nor even a nature reserve, and for very good reasons. Take, for instance, this lagoon I'm painting. Today it's full of fish and plants, a great place for birds. But in two weeks it will be dry and the duck will have moved to a new lagoon. The floodplain is too changeable for any one part of it to be declared a reserve. Another strong reason for not putting a fence around this area is that people also depend on this land. In the background of this painting is Seri, a village I've come to know well in the last few days. In one half of the village live the livestock herders and in the other, fishermen and cereal growers. For the moment, this lagoon is feeding the entire village, as well as the birds. It would be unthinkable to keep villagers like these from such a vital lifeline. The pygmy goose is actually smaller than any African duck and in the delta is found only in these water lily marshes along with the jacana or lily trotter. The Islamic call to prayer opens the day for the villagers of Seri. It really is bitterly cold here in the early morning, and both cattle and storks are waiting for the sun to get up before they move off. Moving with the livestock as always are cattle egrets, flying ahead to snatch insects disturbed by the cattle. Most of the nomadic herds are on the floodplain now, and for as far as I can see, Seri is surrounded by cattle. Pratting coals rest on mud patches trampled bare by the cattle between bouts of hawking over the herds for insects. And close to the village, godwit feed and roost, sharing the pools with women washing clothes. 
It's now late January, and there are 40,000 black-tailed godwit in the delta. As other areas dry out, the godwit flock at Seri grows larger every day. This godwit is still in its winter plumage, but already in some birds there is a hint of the brighter summer plumage breaking through on the head and breast. The godwit molt now during these last weeks of their stay in Africa. Life would be too hectic on the breeding grounds, so it's better to molt here, where for the godwit at least, the pace is more leisurely. But for these farmers, even here at Seri, the flood didn't arrive in time for this field. They are ploughing now in the hope that next year's flood will yield a crop. If a crop fails, there's no standing around. These people always seem to be on the move, searching for a harvest to help with, or wild fruits they can collect. These women are treading the mud to find water lily tubers. The tubers will be boiled and eaten as a basic food when the rice runs out. When the first woman took these wild fruits to market, she was shunned. Wild foods were supposed to be kept as a free supply for the hungry. When times are bad, wild food can also include birds. To me, white storks, with their simple profile, are great subjects to paint. But for a villager with only one expensive cartridge, the approachable stork represents a large meal, enough to feed his family for a week. But sadly, the numbers of white storks are declining. In 1984, the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, known as IUCN, began a project here. One of the many problems they tackled was the shooting of storks. Villagers sometimes keep bird rings to make necklaces. The stork that once wore this ring came all the way from Spain. Having spent time with these people, I can understand that IUCN's main concern is not just to protect birds, but to build up all the natural resources, particularly the grasslands and woods, far more crucial to the people's livelihood. Their message is simply that these resources must be harvested carefully so the next generation can eat. I'm intrigued by the way IUCN is tackling the problems. So many cultures, five different languages. Yet in order to help, they've decided they must learn from the people themselves more about their way of life. Amadou Cham, one of the team of field workers, wants to learn how much money this woman will get for the milk she's brought to market. He'll use the information to build up a picture of how a herdsman makes sure that his family is fed throughout the year. Kulibali, another field worker, asks this farmer how long the sack of rice he brought home from the harvest will last his family. Another three weeks is the answer. At another village, IUCN's ecologist, Jamie Skinner, 
discusses who controls access to the surrounding land. La plupart des terres sont parcelles individuelles plutôt que pour le village. The village wood was once a thriving heron colony. Now it's dying. Jamie tells me that the lack of flood water has weakened the trees and the goats are doing the rest of the damage. Jamie is encouraging the villagers to plant acacia seeds downhill from the old wood in areas where the flood is deeper. The next step is to keep the goats away, long enough for the trees to mature. Not far away, in another wood, the number of nesting birds is actually increasing thanks to the protection it now gets from the local villagers. Right now, there are 250 pairs of spoonbills breeding here. And through the year, the wood supports 13 different species, 12,000 breeding pairs. Is enough here to keep me occupied for days. The villagers protect this wood not to enjoy watching herons, but because they're now more aware that when woods are destroyed, the goats go hungry. And with no nesting birds, there'll be no chicks to eat when the people are starving and no bird droppings to fertilize the breeding grounds of the fish. Barra, a famous praise singer, has spread the story of the woodland success throughout the delta. I bought a cassette of this music. It sold thousands of copies, and as far away as the Ivory Coast, they play this song. Barra's song is also about another success. These villagers are planting bare areas with bogu grass. Bogu is a floating grass which collapses when the flood retreats. It has to be trampled into the ground before new growth can sprout. Normally, the grass is trampled not by the people, but by the cattle as they graze. With these self-help schemes, the field workers are showing the villagers that with careful management of their grass and woodlands, they can actually do something to offset the worst of the drought. Now, towards the end of February, the cattle have finally reached the best grazing close to the lake. It's amazing to think that at the height of the flood, this was under 12 feet of water. Around the lake itself, the borgu is still afloat, and the fishermen have cut channels through it to travel from camp to camp following the fish. I've seen harriers in every habitat so far. But here, on this busy waterway, this is what I call real harrier country.
For my money, the Montague's Harrier is the most elegant on the wing. Like all Harriers, it flies slowly, heading into the wind, all the while searching for the slightest rustle in the grass. The rice straw on this boat is for smoking fish and is on its way to a fishing camp on the lake. And that's where I'm heading next. I work as quickly as I can, but all too often the subject escapes me. The only thing to do is to wait for another boat or find something else to paint. The birds are one jump ahead of me. On the way to the lake, I found yellow wagtails again. And not far away, the duck and waders are concentrated into the last open channel. I can sense the urgency. Soon this channel will be dry too. As the waters shrink behind them, the fish are forced to swim through this narrow gap and into the lake. The fishermen build four dams across this choke point, and two and a half thousand people set their biggest and final camp on the lake shore. This place simply heaves with activity, and the birds are crowded here too, in their thousands, all feasting on the fish trapped by the dams. The umbrella above my easel allows me to paint in any direction. It keeps the sun out of my eyes and the glare off the paper. It's incredible. So many powerful images, a different challenge at every glance. I'm beginning to think that nothing I put down on paper will catch the dramatic mix of birds and people crammed here together. The frenzied activity of this place must have got to me, for I've tipped this painting into the water not once, but twice. But thanks to the African sun, the painting was already bone dry, so all I need do now is retouch the edges.
At first glance, the fishing appears to be a free-for-all, but the family who founded this camp are in strict control. They own the baskets on the first dam, where the fishing is best. The last dam is loaned out to the increasing number of strangers who turn up each year for a chance at the catch. The entire family is at work, fishing day and night. The constant noise and smell of this place will live with me. These women are not from traditional fishing families. They've come from areas where the cereal crop has failed and will be paid for their work in fish. The fish are laid out to dry on rice straw and are then smoked before they begin to rot. The fishing here is so crucial to these people, it's surprising that they tolerate the birds. I thought the fishermen would accuse the terns of stealing their catch. But they say that when the birds are plentiful, the fishing is good. Perhaps men and birds are simply too busy to worry about disturbing each other. The birds seem to employ as many different techniques as the fishermen. Pied kingfishers hover and plunge, then return to a perch to swallow the catch. And little egrets, as well as great white egrets and reef herons, run and stab in the shallows. I always think black herons look like enormous barnacles when they're canopy feeding. This method is unique, but no one's quite sure how it works. The umbrella could simply be used as a trap to lure the fish into the shade. The black herons, like all the other birds, take advantage of the dams With this bonanza of fish around the traps, any thoughts of drought seem far away. But the peak only lasts for three short weeks. The high concentration of birds inevitably leads to some aggression as they compete for the best perches.
The birds, like the people, have little time to waste. Fish caught in traps seem like easy pickings. Of course, there will always be individual casualties. But as long as the flood is good, the people and the birds will have a future. After all I've experienced of life in this delta, it seems incredible that flood water can be seen by governments as wastewater. Water they could take from upstream for hydroelectricity or commercial irrigation systems. The effect is made worse because the delta isn't completely flat. Each new dam might only take an inch or two from the height of the flood, but it's enough to stop the water getting over a rise and reaching hundreds of villages on the other side. Elsewhere in the world, floods are bringing devastation and death. But here, beyond Timbuktu, without the flood, there is no life. IUCN is showing the people that when the flood is poor, there is a way to help themselves. But when the flood fails, they have only one choice, to leave. Each year that the flood falls short, it drains away earlier and the dry season grows longer. Will the woods and grasslands last long enough to see these people through to the next flood? And will the migrants gather enough fuel to see them safely back to Europe? Before I came here, I heard that thousands of sand martins and whitethroats hadn't made it home from the Sahel. Now I've seen this part of their life story, I can begin to understand why. Flood or no flood? Paradise or desert, the silence of the spring in Europe may first be heard here in the Sahel. Nan bo di bedi adade, metu di se adade, jo poji di bete denga jere. 